Good afternoon and welcome to the British Society of Gerontology special interest group on aging, business and societies workshop. How can gerontologists and business work together for mutual benefit? I'm Rob Walton, deputy chair of the SIG and on behalf of everyone who's prepared today's workshop, we're delighted that so many of you have been able to come along to share your experiences and views and to learn on this topic. Through its work and in pursuit of our mission, the British Society of Gerontology, Aging, Business and Society is uniquely placed to ask three critical questions of ourselves, our communities and our society. First, how can we empower social gerontology to work effectively with and within business? Second, how can we support business to better understand aging and older people? And third, how can gerontology and business work together to enable the WHO decade of healthy aging? We're going to continue to explore these questions today with this our second workshop uh, series in the series with what we hope will be an exciting, inclusive and conclusive series of events that help us to think strategically and creatively about opportunities and challenges, solutions, best practices and ultimately impact. I will tell you more about our future events towards the end of this session, but first let's get down to business. This afternoon we're going to he hear from a range of longevity leaders who are passionate about partnerships. It's our hope that we address and explore what it means to support gerontology and business to partner for mutual benefit, why that is important and how working together we can really make a difference. Leading us through today's session are our facilitators, Debbie Keeling, Deputy Pro Vice Chancellor, Knowledge Exchange at the University of Sussex, and George McGuinness, Healthy Aging Challenge Director at UK Research and Innovation. Before I hand over to Debbie and George, a few housekeeping points uh, that we'd just like to make. First, this is a workshop, and so we're really keen to hear from you. The meeting is being recorded and we've enabled both audio and video for all our delegates. So please do re be respectful when using that of other participants in the room. Please keep your microphone switched off where possible uh, and your video too. And please use hands up or connect with the moderators if you have a question or you want to speak. Later in the meeting, we're gonna split out into breakout groups. We have five to choose from covering three key areas of focus. Debbie and George will tell you a bit more about that in a while but you will be asked to decide for yourself which room you enter. Uh, and so where possible, please uh, plug the, uh, the link to take you to the room. Uh, and if you have any trouble, please just head back to the main room and we'll be able to redirect you. Finally, just to re-emphasize, this is a, a workshop and we're really keen to get the most from this event. So please participate fully, bring your energy, your head, your heart, but especially your voice to this event. Thank you very much. And over to Debbie and George. Thanks so much, Rob. And um, I'm, I'm also really delighted to uh, welcome you to the second workshop of the uh, BSG STIG. Um, so today we're really going to focus on exploring what it takes to forge closer links between gerontologists, business, and older consumers, uh, particularly thinking around how do we really enhance impact from research? How do we help businesses to succeed? How do we help uh, consumers, older consumers, to get, in, to get really engaged in that conversation? And um, echoing Rob's emphasis earlier, what we really want to do is, is highlight good practice. So we are looking to highlight uh, cases of good practice, but we also might invite you to, to highlight cases where you think uh, practice hasn't been as good and we can learn from that. And also to um, identify priorities for what you think uh, we as a SIG can do to promote collaboration between businesses, gerontologists and consumers. Debbie, and you're right, this should be a win-win but it's not happening and, and why, and that's really what we want to discover and see um, how much the BSG can do uh, to address that. Um, I'd just like to add to the welcome. It's wonderful to see so many people from so many uh, places outside the UK um, joining us today. Um, so to facilitate that sort of 
uh, contact, what we're going to do, we'll, we'll hear from um, our speakers to begin with. We're then going to go into a series of breakout rooms where you should be able to have um, a more intimate discussion. Uh, we'll set you a very simple task uh, as part of that, that, that breakout and then come together and, and discuss it. Uh, as we're going through, I think it'd be great if um, you felt able to enter um, a quick introduction to who you are in the chat um, so that everyone can see who's, who's on the, um, the workshop and on the call. Um, and um, as we're going through discussion, please feel free to use the sort of the, the, the button to, to either raise your hand virtually or, or to wave in the camera uh, to attract the uh, facilitator's attention. So uh, don't, don't be shy in coming forward is, is really what I'm saying. Uh, so that's all the admin, I think, that, that, that we want to do. Um, over back to Debbie to introduce our first speaker. Thanks, George. Um, I am very highly delighted to welcome Suzanne Noble, who's our first uh, speaker today. And Suzanne has had a really fascinating and varied career. Uh, from early days in the media as a producer and a journalist, um, then venturing into business as a founder of Frugal and Nestful, and most recently co-founder for Startup School for Seniors. Thank you so much for being with us, Suzanne. Thank you very much for having me. Well, we all know that the pandemic has forced many of us online, including older people who used it to stay connected to their friends and their family. And now they're part of a growing group of consumers that are using platforms, including TikTok, for instance, and joining shared 3D spaces or the metaverse as it's being known. And now more than ever before, both young people and older are moving between these physical and these virtual worlds with ease. And what we know is that this group has substantial buying power and they cannot and they should not be ignored. For example, I recently discovered that in 2021, every single day, 38% of all consumers age 60 plus visited a social networking site compared to 51% of consumers age 15 to 29. And 8% of consumers age 60 plus took part in online video gaming compared to 21% of consumers age 15 to 29. So while we often hear that older people are mainly technological Luddites, this has not been my experience running Startup School for Seniors. Technology is easier to use than ever before. And just as an example, for instance, my parents, both in their 80s, joined House Party at the start of the pandemic to keep in contact with all of us, which then turned into regular Zoom sessions. And they had no problem using, using either of those uh, pieces of software at all. And they regularly use YouTube. And my mom even has an Instagram channel and she's 83 years old. So with very little encouragement, Startup School for Seniors Learners are able to access and participate in our virtual classroom. And what's more, the majority of them are using technology as part of their own business model, whether that means building a simple website or at the other extreme, we have someone in our current cohort who's creating a software solution to address loneliness and isolation. At Startup School for Seniors, we have many learners who unable to meet, um, to find a solution to um, meet the challenges created by our aging society are creating businesses for themselves that address these large societal problems to make their own and everybody else's lives easier. They're not waiting around for big corporations to finally getting around to seeing the big business opportunity aimed at this growing demographic, but they're creating companies for themselves. Um, as an example, we have someone who is currently creating a community to support informal carers someone who's making the foster care system easier for would-be foster carers to navigate and participate in, helping older people to go on holiday while doing good for their local community in the places they're visiting, supporting people with their end of life plans when they're not living with them. These kinds of people are virtually ignored by venture capitalists who tend to be, in my experience, more attracted to whizzy hardware solutions, mainly invented by millennials to allegedly support a grandparent's challenge. That's just my experience. And 
our cohort of over 50s are creating products and services out of their own lived experience and with far reaching benefits. It's time we stopped ignoring the value of this age group's lived and work experience and recognize not just the power of the gray pound, but also how they can shape products and services of the future to meet everyone's needs. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have a time for um, a couple of questions, but uh, one or two in between if um, we have any. I think I've just seen introductions at the moment in the chat. If not, we'll move on to our second uh, speaker. I, I realise what I said about waving instead of waving the current display. Debbie, there is a question Debbie, in which is, when is the next cohort? Um, we're running a two-week intensive version of the program starting on the 28th of March, which is actually um, a paid-for program. And then we've got a program that's funded by local authorities starting in May. Thank you. And we have another one, Suzanne, what is the age range of your startup founders? Um, our startup founders range from any age can join, but our youngest founder has been 37 and our oldest 83. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Catherine Foote. Thanks, Debbie. Hello, everyone. I'm Catherine, do you want me to just um, do my five minutes now, Debbie? Yeah, I was going to give you a quick introduction, though. Sure, go for <laughs> That's it. That's okay. Thanks. Catherine, you're the director of Phoenix Insights, uh, and you've recently established the longevity think tank for Phoenix Insurance, uh, which is a company that uh, I'm sure all of us are familiar with, whose brands include the likes of Sun Life and Standard Life. And uh, you've also built your career around using research to inform policy. With, with roles in Cancer Research UK, the King's Fund, and until recently, uh, a, a centre that we're all very familiar with, the Centre for Aging Better, where you're a Director of Evidence. Thank you, Catherine, for joining us today. Thanks so much, Debbie. Really delighted to be here. Really appreciate um, the invitation. I have a huge soft spot for the gerontology community from the BSG. I remember very fondly dancing to the um, Beatles cover band. I think it must have been 2019's BSG annual conference in the Anfield Stadium in Liverpool, if any, anybody else was there that night. Um, yes, yeah, so as Debbie said, um, I just, slightly to my own surprise, joined the private sector um, to start a new longevity think tank. And, and that company is, 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 is actually probably not necessarily one you have all heard of, although as Debbie says, with um, uh, lots of companies inside it, like Standard Life with more of a brand, you might be more familiar, but yes, Phoenix Group is the overall company in which I now work. Big um, pensions and insurance company, got 13 million customers in the, in the sort of FTSE 100. And it's one of those companies that uh, genuinely wants to have, have social, positive social impact, contribute in some meaningful way to its social purpose. And they have landed on longevity, longer life expectancies. And, the implications that they have um, for all of us as individuals and for the way that we think about the social structures that support us um, in society um, as the topic to, to land on and try and, uh, and try and make a difference in. And so Phoenix Insights is this new think tank um, that I am, um, I am setting up. Um, and you asked me today to um, offer some reflections on the ways in which business and the gerontology community could develop a more kind of mutually mutually constructive and, and, and effective relationship with each other. Um, I think, of course, I'll just say a few things then. Um, so firstly, I suppose, I think, of course, that this initiative, Phoenix Insights, that I'm now leading, you know, is a really crunchy and I think significant in terms of its funding, about two million a year, um, example of a company that is really explicitly saying it is hungry for research, for knowledge, and crucially for sort of actionable insight into uh, what people are experiencing, what they need, what they want, what could help them solve problems, meet needs, meet desires. Um, so I suppose I think that it's an obvious thing to say, but like any non-academic 
potential consumer of research, the company certainly in which I find myself, um, you know, those sorts of knowledge translation activities that, that help to share findings, that summarize, that reduce to the essentials, that make things in plain English are just so critically important. Um, as is, of course, just simply knowing who knows about what and who's doing what. I think there could be a huge potential connecting role for, for the BSG here, I think, in sort of make, giving a platform for, for some of the, um, the teams, the units, the individuals, uh, a searchable database or something, some way in which those of us outside academia can explore, um, well, who are the experts in these things that I want to know more about and learn more about? I certainly find particularly at the sort of really senior echelons within business, people just like talking to people as a means to get their insight and evidence much more than they like reading uh, any sort of information, certainly not um, academic journal papers, um, sadly. So I think some sort of you know, actual human to human um, networking um, relationship and ability for us to, to understand who's doing what is, 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 would be really useful. I think though, that actually we've got to recognize the different timescales that perhaps sometimes industry and academia work on such that who's doing research now may not always be super useful because perhaps anything that they're gonna publish isn't gonna come out for another two years um, or even longer. Um, and so I think my second point would be, I think that um, in pers my personal view would be that uh, academia in general isn't, doesn't invest nearly as much as I wish it did in evidence synthesis, in making it really easy to access what is already known um, in a discipline. Um, and I think we could do so much more, um, so much more there. I think, um, of course, you know, if, 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 if industry hungry for, for knowledge and insight is one way around, I think the reverse of that relationship is also true. So I think, um, you know, certainly a company like Phoenix Group, yeah, we are holders and producers of a wealth of public consumer data, rich data, you know, on how people behave, on what people are buying, who has what, what journeys they take um, with different, uh, in different parts of their lives, in the case of Phoenix, of course, in terms of long-term savings. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, industry as a source of, um, of data with which to conduct secondary research, I think, is, is an underexplored area of the relationship. And then I realized that we haven't got long to give these remarks. So let me just offer one final reflection since I've joined Phoenix in uh, the summer of last year. Uh, the summer of you last know, year. People in, you know, people in, people, sorry, I can just hear myself again now. Um, it's one of those awkward things where it's relaying we hear back you to fine, me. Catherine. Okay, jolly good, I'll just try and ignore it. Um, my final point was just simply that, you know, people in the industry are just people and they are as ageist, they hold, in the same levels of ingrained ageism and, uh, and negative attitudes about aging and growing old as anybody. And so I think, you know, that relationship and that effort of the gerontology community to challenge assumptions um, about, about ageism, to challenge stereotypes, uh, to bust myths um, about what it is like um, to be old and to age, I think is a hugely important contribution to, to people in industry as much as it is to all of us in society. Thank you so much, Catherine. Um, I, I, again, I'm just looking at the chat. We don't have any immediate questions no, fine. at the moment. Um, I'm just, uh, and then one pops up. So what is the uh, lead, what is leading the direction of Phoenix research topics, business needs or external societal agendas? And that's from Alison. I mean, thank you, Alison. Hello. Um, I think um, in the longer term, I hope to develop enough sort of soft power, if you like, inside this company that, that the company are asking for insight that will help them do better in terms of delivering products and services for customers. Um, I think for now, though, it's very much uh, and, and will always be, but for now is really very squarely in the, um, you know, what are the important issues in the, uh, for social impact? Um, although I would say that I am working quite closely with Phoenix, the company as an employer, of 8,000 people of all different ages, and they're very committed to an agenda around being a better age-friendly employer. So there's, there's some work I've got underway there, but no, principally I'm looking through a lens of, um, you know, what are the changes in society that we need to see 
to respond better to longevity. I want those issues, though, to be issues that make sense as issues that a pensions company has a think tank that would talk about. So I will also be focusing on, in particular, issues around money, around employment, around skills and lifelong learning. And that, that's a nexus of issues around you know, money and work, because uh, I think um, that's just you know, a coherent strategy for me, me to adopt, at least in the short term. Thank you. We've got uh, two questions actually, uh, but more, we, we won't have time for all of them. So I'm just going to, uh, we can come back to them though later. Um, if healthy aging is a nascent new forming industry, is there a need for a new industry stakeholder group? That's from James, separate, that's separate to academia or government. I, stakeholder group sort of organized by who, for what, for what purpose? Yeah, I don't know, maybe. Um, I mean, you, you can set up lovely talking shops that don't that don't achieve very much for it quickly, though, can't you? That's that's always very easy to do. Um, I'm sure this special interest group will be so much more um, than a talking shop. Um, but yes, I mean, I certainly think that um, you know the Healthy Aging Challenge Fund that I've been involved on the on the edges of um, for um, for years is a is a wonderful example, isn't it? Of a sort of as you say, a burgeoning, almost a burgeoning industry unto itself that has huge potential to learn from each other and to make sure a responsibility to learn from each other, actually, that, the, that, that particularly in, in the sort of entrepreneur and innovation end of, of the spectrum, that we're not reinventing the wheel um, and that we're, we're building on what's done before, not sort of repeating past mistakes. So I'm sure better communication together could, you know, must be a good thing, isn't it? Thank you, Catherine. And James says, yep, yeah, in, the, in, the, in the chat there. I'm, I'm going to introduce our next speaker, but there are two more questions there for you as well, if, if you'd like to have a look at them in the chat. And um, we can either answer them later on, or if you feel you can answer them in the chat, please do so. Will do, Debbie, thank you. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Sanjay Lobo. Hi there, um, nice to see everyone. Uh, do I jump in? Or? I, I, I'm just waiting to see you. Hi, Sanjay. So, uh, very welcome. Um, a little intro for you. Um, uh, you've started your working life as a lawyer and then you moved into marketing and innovation. And um, in 2019, you founded um, On Hand, um, which has proved to be uh, what can only be described as an incredibly well timed move. Um, and you've also been awarded your MBE for services to older people. Many congratulations for that. And, and, and that's particularly during COVID-19 in the recent New Year's honours. Um, on Hand uh, was also named as Volunteering Organisation of the Year 2021, I understand too. Thank you very much, over to you. Thanks, thanks for the intro. Um, hi everyone. So yes, I, I'm, I'm from an organisation called On Hands. Uh, we started around 2019 and um, the, the reason we started was I was struggling with my dad and my dad getting me shopping. Um, he's in his, uh, well he was in his 70s, he's had Parkinson's, he was just getting to the age where he just couldn't, couldn't quite pick up his shopping um, and he couldn't walk that far and all that kind of stuff. Um, and he was really lucky, he lives in a building block that had professional carers on site, absolutely wonderful, and they started doing uh, his shopping for him. Problem was, his, his weekly shop used to be like £10 to £12 a week. Single guy, doesn't eat that much. Very, very low cost. Um, and all of a sudden, his bills were like £30, £30 a week for his shopping. Um, and it wasn't that anyone was doing anything wrong. It's just professional care costs a lot of money, even for something relatively simple like getting your weekly shopping. Um, and I kind of thought about that issue and was um, thinking there must be a different way. Uh, and on hand wasn't my idea. It was put together um, by a group called Fill Innovation. Ooh, I'm hearing that repeat thing as well, but it's gone. Um, but a good innovation working with a bunch of charities, people like uh, the Red Cross, RNIB, WaterAid, who all had an issue with recruiting a younger demographic into volunteering. Um, and they knew they the way they onboarded volunteers just wouldn't work in the new world, right? They did 10 weeks of training, commit to the same time every week uh, for the next six months and maybe get to volunteer. They knew that was broken. And so their idea was, what if we made volunteering mobile first, incredibly flexible, drop in, drop out whenever you like, but it's like a Netflix, Tinder-like, Uber-like experience. Um, I think Deliveroo is the best one. It's like Deliveroo, where you can scroll through on your location, find someone to help, and you know what? You don't fill in a form, you just go and help someone. <laughs> just like ordering a takeaway, but you're doing some good. Um, and so that was the genesis of the idea. Uh, we launched um, that in 20, yeah, 2019, 
we signed up thousands of volunteers, like immediately more volunteers that we could, than we could, we could process. You know, the, the tech was uh, really early stage, so we couldn't, we couldn't quite deal with it, turned it all off. And when we were ready to go, they all were there. They were all were there because people want to do good, essentially. So um, that's the story of how we got started. Uh, it was really interesting hearing um, both the commentaries uh, earlier, but uh, um, from Catherine, it was really interesting hearing about companies and companies want to be responsible and her company in particular wants to be involved in, in, in longevity. Um, and that's the trend. We're seeing that the world is changing massively and very, very quickly. This time last year, I'd be talking to uh, corporates because we work with corporates at this point to onboard their employees and the employees volunteer, right? So we work with we're basically an employee engagement tool take on hand, engage your employees, they'll do local good wherever they are, who knew would be right timing for remote work, it just works everywhere in the country so we can engage your remote workers. Um, and those businesses pay us, they pay us to engage their employees, um, everyone's happy. Um, but the conversation we were having with businesses this time last year was you've got to do this because your consumers are demanding you do social and eco good. Uh, and then it was um, employers coming to us saying, it's well-being. Our, our, our employees are going literally nuts at home. Please, can you help them by engaging them in doing some local good? Fantastic. The conversation has changed again, and, you know, just within 12 months, with businesses just like um, uh, Catherine essentially saying, we've got to do ESG good, and we know we're responsible for doing it. And so all of a sudden, um, you've got the business world wanting to be involved in a really, really big way in ESG, and I think it's only going to increase. You see, you see the rise of B Corp and all that stuff. It's right at the start of that trend, um, as, as far as I can tell. Um, so how can organizations help and how can this community help more? Uh, I think it's the connecting the dots bit and um, the healthy aging chapter at Innovate UK has been incredible for us. Uh, I don't think we'd be here and still around if it wasn't for the support of the health, healthy aging innovation uh, UK uh, chapter. Um, and then it's connections like people at the National Innovation Center for Aging who spotted us early and said, hey, what does it take to bring us to Newcastle? We, we literally just got growing uh, in London. It was like, Newcastle, really? But you know what? It, it works. We went there, we met wonderful businesses. They were really happy to pay us to engage their employees. And all of a sudden, we're kind of in multiple cities. Um, that doesn't really happen um, that easily. And so when I think about the examples of other people we can connect to, well, why aren't we in with NHS tracks? And lots of people say, because you just can't get in. It takes, takes forever. And you have to go through backdoor routes. Why? <laughs> Why? It's taken us three years to have a conversation with NHS Trust. In fact, we avoid them. We avoid them because we know we won't break through. Same with councils. We, we avoid councils because we know, we know what takes so long to break through. The same with very large businesses. It will take so long to break through, we'll be out of business. That has got to change. Um, and so if there was a, an ask on how business can work with um, um, our older aging communities at this point, it's that. It's break down some of these barriers to connecting. Um, last point I think I was asked to end on was, uh, what are we doing next? Um, there's some really interesting things. Um, um, I think Suzanne mentioned some of them at the start around the tech engagement from older folks. Well, it's, if they do engage in tech, so why can't we engage them in what we're doing? And why can't they help um, and give, give great, great amounts of time? Because by the way, they've got plenty of time. They're one of the people that are most, um, I guess, time rich. Um, and then um, the other piece to it is we are expanding what we do into lots of different areas of social good, but also eco good. So what's the difference? It's all impact, right? So we want to do social good across all major areas of, um, uh, I guess, big societal issues. But very quickly in that area, you hit on climate change. So why can't everyone we engage on our platform also take actions in their daily life or work life to have climate impacts? By the way, we'll track all of your CO2 reductions doing that. And then the interesting thing on that is that's healthy aging too, because saving the planet keeps us all alive. By the way, pollution reduces your lifespan. And if you're innovative enough, you realize this stuff. So someone like National Innovation Center of Aging have jumped on that. It's part of their plans and ambitions for the long term. It's all healthy aging. I'll, I'll show that. Thanks so much, Sanjay. Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree with you on the last point as well about the, uh, you know, if, we, uh, if what we do for healthy aging, it's also good for the planet too and vice versa. Um, uh, we, have, we have a question for you here uh, from Anthony. What are the top three things you say to a new corporate when pitching to them? Um, it's a great question. So uh, there's a couple of things we do that are really different. One is we're on-demand volunteering. I think I described a bit of that. It's not fill in this form, wait to hear from the charity, maybe they'll get back to it. It's, it's not that. It is look on your phone, just like you're scrolling on Deliveroo to find a takeaway. Find the thing you like to do, go do it, go and do it right now. 
and it works anywhere in the country, wherever you are. So it's it's work from home. Wow, right? It works for remote workers. We didn't know COVID was coming, but we built something that just works for us working well. And then I go on to say the engagement rates are ridiculous. It's 50% of your employees will engage and actually be active on this app. 90% of them repeat, 70% of them will do eco and social good. Um, so that's my, my top three. Thank you, Sanjay. Um, George has a question for you. So, uh, hi, Sanjay, and uh, no, well, thank you for the call out for, for the programme, but I think the credit's all yours, so. <laughs> thank you. Um, <laughs> um, I want to sort of go back to Catherine's last point on ageism, um, and sort of, uh, given that this is a BSG meeting about what you can learn from businesses, um, you know, Catherine was sort of saying that uh, essentially um, businesses are full of a reflection of the general population. So you will expect to get ageist sort of attitudes, even in volunteering. And we see that in, in a lot of innovations that are well meant, but not, not necessarily well targeted. Mm. Um, what have you learned about what you've got to do with your volunteers to um, get them in the right frame to, to give the right sort of support for um, older people? Yeah, um, so there's a couple of things around it. One is, I think the comment is is spot on. Um, and the reality is, um, some of the volunteering we do is not for everyone. So um, we hopefully give a choice so people can choose something they really tune into. And then hopefully we get them interested in other things too. Um, the second point around it is just, just some education. So the number one uh, piece of volunteering on, on hand is, is still befriending calls by, by, by a long margin. and some like um, independent age refers to us on a national basis, which is, which is brilliant. And we, and we do thousands of, that, of those kind of calls. But the way we work, again, it's on demand. So literally you scroll this list, you find something cool, you call them. Um, that's a bit nerve wracking if you've never called someone before in a befriending environment. Um, if you do that kind of thing with Age UK, they'll take you through 10 weeks of training. So what we do is we have like videos and um, um, I guess um, um, written material that you can access on the app. There's a, uh, I guess, a. a it's more like a 20 minute video where we talk about tricks and tips for doing your first befriending call and we have a cheat sheet for how you can um, you know, introduce yourself, introduce who we are, uh, have topics to talk about and um, you know, tips for what if, what if that, that call doesn't go the way you're expecting. Not every befriending call is going to be a happy jolly affair. You're calling a lot of people who've been lonely, may not have spoken to someone for the last month and they may start crying on you. So what do you do in that scenario? So we, we try and take people through those educational steps. Uh, and educate them a little bit around, um, uh, I guess, loneliness. Uh, though that's one extreme of, I guess, the area we work in. But uh, as an example, that's that's how we help. Thank you, Sanjay. Great, thank you. Um, we you've got you, we have more questions flowing in for you, Sanjay, in the chat. So I'm I'm going to do the same as before. Just ask you if you could have a look at those while we while the other speaker presents. But there is an, a, a, there is an important question that's being posed by Judith on safeguarding, which you were some of the issues you were, you were just touching on then. Um, so I'm going to, uh, we can maybe come back to that one at the end. I'm going to introduce Mariana. Hi, Mariana. Thanks so much for being with us. Today. Hi, Debbie. Um, and so we, we, we know that you profess to love building products in the area of mobility, robotics, and automation. And your early career were uh, included design, product manager roles for companies, including Volkswagen and Daimler. And in 2019, you took uh, a brave decision to join SYNC's uh, Healthy Aging Mission 3, and from which of that you have very successfully co-founded Tonus Tech, uh, which develops uh, wearable robotics products uh, to help people optimize their exercise and to get extra strength to overcome some of those physical limitations that they might be facing. Over to you, Marianne. Thank you, David. Thank you for the nice introduction. I'm really happy to, um, to be here and to have the opportunity to tell you about our journey with Onostack. And uh, when I um, talked the first time with Debbie about my intervention, we thought that maybe it could be very interesting to tell you a bit how we combine technology, design and business in our, uh, in our company. I will start with technology telling you a little bit about why I moved to the UK and decided to attend SYNC. So basically, Tonos Tech is, has been founded by three technologists. So I come from automotive and industrial automation. Uh, my co-founder team is a robotics engineer that worked in drones and uh, in um, uh, atomic sector. <laughs> and uh, Ahmed is uh, actually a doctor originally, but then he worked uh, with the sensoric technologies for the, the, the gate detection and assessment. 
And one thing, it's a kind of, let's say a call of action that I would like to give to the, this community of gerontologists today is um, there are a lot of technologists that would like to become giro technologists nowadays. That has been our case because we were, uh, I mean, in Japan, we didn't know each other before, but we were really, really interested in this field. And one thing that we discovered uh, in our journey is that we have found more and more people who actually get excited to work in the sector. And for example, last year, we have been in a robotics incubator and uh, we were the only startup working more on a, first of all, a wearable technology and then a technology that was not for an industrial, uh, for an industrial application uh, directly. <laughs> and, uh, and that was really interesting because we found a lot of other people coming from di different these companies and from the Technology Institute that hosted us that uh, were um, really uh, noticing how many of the technologies that they were using in the field of sensoric, even of navigation, could be really applied to many applications towards, um, let's say, not only the older generation, because for me, gerontology is not about, it's about aging in general. So we have really uh, noticing this, uh, and it's an exciting field. And our, uh, we were really surprised that the only technology for the, for the aging generation that was in this incubator was the um, PARO, so that kind of uh, robotics puppy for assisting people with dementia. That is true. I mean, I understand this is social robots are interesting, but I think that there is a prejudice towards gerontology and many technologists see their intervention only in assisting technology. So now I go to the design uh, uh, part of our job. One thing that we really were trying to do is uh, uh, the fact of not uh, working for an assistive technology. So we use uh, um, in our wearables, both sensing technology and also soft robotics technology to let's say assess, but also support movement or guide the movement. But we, we didn't want to create an assistive technology. We wanted to create a technology that people could really like. So what we did is that we put a part, I mean, we, we were doing, we were prototyping and doing all the stuff like that, but we put a little bit apart this technological part. And what we did is that uh, we really tried to understand, not only talk with, with people, of course, but also trying to understand which are the, um, the people in, in the, let's say, sports community that people really trust. So for example, we talk with, and actually we have also in team now, personal trainers, um, people who manage uh, sports community. Actually I've seen in the, in the participant, there is the golf community. I love what you do I, if you are there. Uh, and, um, and, and in general, we went, actually we, we, we did the sports ourselves with them, with this community. So working football, uh, running groups. Uh, we, we met a lot of people that, for example, joined the running groups after, um, after a, a, a bad disease. So overcoming a bad disease. This is because we found that uh, at every age, people feel old also when they feel weak. And so sport give a lot of strength, give really a lot of vitality. And uh, from the design point of view, we loved really to work directly with people, um, especially, as I said, like really um, uh, personal trainers are wonderful. They are really the trusted people by their clients. And they've told so much about like the change of the conception of their body. So how people uh, have a kind of change their, the, um, their, their self-perception. And uh, it, has been, it, it has been really amazing. So we went through all these journeys. And one other aspect of that is uh, we are a um, smart garment company, so robots. And one important thing is fashion. Fashion and style is very important in these products. And uh, we actually hired uh, some fashion designers. So for example, we are collaborating with a friend of mine that designed for Max Mara in Italy, because this is a brand that matches a little bit young in the old generations, uh, but also with the, the help of the National Center of Aging that was already mentioned, uh, we actually approached uh, one Italian group of fashion that is really cool because they are interested in designing for every generation. So they have different brands and they're really interested in this. And, 
It's, um, I also talked, for example, with the, 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 the lady that uh, um, managed the Booming Anchor uh, uh, blog that I love, I always read, because she published something regarding sportswear for, the, for everybody. For, and this is very important. So I found also and put in touch with a lot of entrepreneurs that are actually designing for women 40 plus. And uh, because our body changes, I mean, mine also changes. And this is really important to understand the taste of people. And uh, so we really were interested to do this. Uh, last part, uh, um, economics. So business. So um, we have really struggled to uh, to to, uh, to talk with investor because of course they want to see the call they want to see the big uh, the big business and uh, of course uh, for a company like us they push us to um, work in a business to business environment so to sell our product directly to business and not to consumer what we have done is that we have really noticed that doing this uh, we can have the um, we can have the problem of uh, underestimating what people really want because even if we um, offer our business our our product to even to longevity company or we make a partnership with an health institution or whatever it is um, or for factories for example they have asked us to do but uh, for us it's very important to take business to consumer at least as a metaphor and a form of mind because this really helps to think to create a consumer product, even if it will not be sell, sell directly to consumer only. But the idea of having a consumer product is really helping us to design it in a different way. So to design also the metrics and represent the metrics that we get in a different way. So this is, uh, let's say a metaphor that is uh, helping us a lot because um, we have seen and we have met people who use the watches or aura and people of every age really, use it i mean we have seen in the gyms this and this means that some kind of products are really well designed so we have really the goal of design a good product like that in particular to design some kind of micro stories so um the small uh, interaction design that help people to improve their life um uh, yeah so maybe i'm too long uh, maybe one last thing that i can i want to say about the business is as i was mentioning before healthy aging and gerontology for me it's not only for people 50 plus or 60 plus so because um, aging is a process uh, that we live in different, we will live from when we are born. And of course, uh, when uh, I talk about um, sports, we talk about people at the end of their sports career. So for example, athletes and athletic longevity, as we talk also about, about people that start again sport uh, after 50 or 60, because they have more time. Or uh, people like me that uh, is uh, approaching the 40 level, the, because that uh, actually, when, once uh, I stopped with uh, corporate, I decided to take care about my body too, again. And so we have different motivations and different motivation to become stronger again. And it's very difficult for me to create a segmentation. So I also struggle to create a kind of fluid segmentation. Although of course in the pitch, I have to tell a lot of things that investors want to hear, but at least we try to be honest with ourselves when we design. That, that's all, sorry. I know. So, thanks so much, Mariana. And we, we have some questions for you in the in the post and, and, and also a, a comment wholly agreeing with what you've been saying as well. Eric is asking, will Tonus produce medical devices or will they be consumer products? Consumer products. products. Consumer products at the beginning, Eric, no, God, I mean, medical device. Uh, after, after we are working, actually, one thing, we are now working, we... Uh, thank you, Iknovich UK, because we got a smart grant and that has been a lot for us. And we are working with the National Center for Aging, the Newcastle University and City University of London, also to understand their certifications for this kind of product, because you always, whatever you blame, you, you blame, you claim that you are giving assess and then you go into the certification need for medical products. So yes, uh, at a certain point we need a certification because wearables have it. But we will enter not with that at the beginning. And we, we have another question, uh, which actually we've, we've spoken about as well, uh, from James. He says, thanks, Mariana, for such a positive talk. I come from an orthotics and prosthetics background and love nice. what you're doing. 
I use Tona Stock Tech as an example of great innovation in healthy aging. My question is, do you think innovators or partners understand your tech products potential route to market? No. The bad, the good one, yes. The bad one, no. <laughs> <laughs> the good one, I mean, we are still a pre-seed, so we are now going into the seed, but we got wonderful angels on board. I mean, people really will, who understood this and that help. So I don't, I don't care about investors that uh, maybe bring money but don't help or give us prop. We need our time to develop the product. Um, it's an hard thing. It's hard, and so we need so our time. We will, we will find our own way to go on, although we struggle and we are not paid so much. But, um, but partners, you mentioned part, part, partners understand better. So partner better, better than invest. Because um, actually it's this, it's a market that has to be built. So it has to be created. So partners are wonderful in this because we don't think about some partnership. Uh, it's, I mean, it's not easy. And then there are people with visions who get it or give us another perspective. Yeah, yeah, of course. And uh, George wants to ask you a question that follows very neatly on from that. So, oh, Mariana, so I just love the, the commentary that you give about engaging personal fitness trainers and people who are joining running clubs, but also um, in engaging the fashion industry. Yeah. The one thing you haven't really talked about is, uh, have you engaged gerontologists? Yeah, of on course, the way? Of no, sir, and, I, no, 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 this I wanted to tell from the beginning. Yes, yes. So, yes. so, so it's perhaps a hypothesis of ours that, that actually a lot of academics are wary of engaging with business. So what was your experience and what advice would you pass on to others? Uh, so first of all, uh, um, I mean, I, here there is Tim Shakespeare from Zinc. And um, so at Zinc, uh, we met also Eric there. Uh, and he killed me. Uh, we, uh, let's, uh, that was a wonderful experience because then we had the possibility of meeting gerontologists. So gerontologists, not only from the medical field or the longevity field, but from sociology, it was a one. It was a fundamental experience because we didn't start immediately with the idea of Tonus Tech. So it's a company builder. Is when you don't know your co-founder, you have no idea what you will uh, make as a business. So you need to to do it little by little. And gerontologists have been really fundamental for us as a driver, a advisor, mentors at the very beginning. Then when we started, and uh, another thing, thanks LinkedIn because. I, I, I really don't like social media, you will not find me on Facebook, uh, but I, I, I somehow became sociable on LinkedIn. <laughs> the reason is because people write to us and there are a lot of academic, that is nice, biomechanics, um, people in neuroscience, uh, there are a lot, there are, there are a lot of areas uh, that are in, in gerontology and around gerontologists. So yes, there are young researchers that are interested. So we also um, are trying to now to um, uh, hire some freelancer postdoc. Yes. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And machine learning, you know, they're in general it's matter of machine learning. Uh, but this is because everyone has a piece of knowledge. So yes, absolutely. This is really important. And it's true, I mean, um, uh, academia can be slow, but people are not slow. <laughs> So this institution is low, but people are not. So yes, uh, there will be, it could be, it would be nice if we could have more possibility of hiring people. And there are actually this uh, uh, during their postdoc or immediately after. So um, to work together with them. Yes, absolutely. Even in phases for our, for, of our development. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Marianne. And um, we're going to move on to our next speaker, but Mariana, there are quite a lot, lot of uh, uh, comments, very supportive comments for you in the chat there for you to you. look at. Thank you. Our next uh, speaker is Colm. I'll wait for Colm to appear. Hi, Colm. Uh, you're very welcome. Uh, Colm is the director of the UK's uh, Design Age Institute, um, which is a collaboration of four leading organisations in the UK, and it's based at the Royal College of Art. And um, your background is as a senior design lead, uh, leader working in business, charitable and public sectors. And you develop, uh, your, your kind of interest is really around developing inclusive products and services. You've also held the head of design um, at a number of organizations, which also include the Ministry of Justice, 
uh, Sainsbury's home base and the NHS National Patient Safety Agency. Over to you, Con. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to talk to you today about a key uh, element of our work at the Design Age Institute, uh, which is to understand both the supply and demand aspects of market failure when it comes to older people. By market failure, we mean the insufficient or unsuitable supply and consumption of products and services produced for a market segment, in this case, older adults. This is important as older adults are not currently fully using their purchasing power to buy products and services that might allow them to live not just longer, but happier and healthier lives with all the personal and societal benefits that this entails. It is currently true that as we age, we spend less money on consumer goods. As such, we need to decide which one of these two statements is true. As we age, we spend less money. Consequently, suppliers stop designing things we might want. Or, as we age, suppliers stop designing things we might want. Consequently, we spend less money. We need to work out which one of these statements is true. Um, what we do know is that at least four and five of those aged over 55 say their favorite retail brands do not understand them and what they need. And anecdotally, we see less interested, interest from industry in creating market segmentation for groups above 50 than we see for groups below 50, which makes no sense as over 50s hold 70% of all household wealth in the UK. And by 2040, over 55s will account for 63 pence uh, in every pound spent. This is a significant and growing market demographic that does seem undersupplied at present. While spending by households age 50 plus is actually predicted to increase, consumption does steadily flatten out soon after retirement and falls at older ages. This is not adequately explained by poverty or a drop in income. In fact, 80 year olds save an estimated annual average of nearly £6,000. Some reasons for reduced spending are said to be poor health, a struggle to get to or around shops and town centres, non inclusive products or services, and a youth oriented market industry. These are important issues, as research suggests, if older people were to access goods and services that met their needs. This could support healthy aging and enable people to feel cognitively young, which is in itself linked to improved health outcomes. It can also support independent living and reduce social isolation and loneliness. All important factors to the government, but more importantly, to all of us aging people. Whatever the reason for market failure, it is hard not to conclude that some form of it is simply ageism. It has been consistently shown that ageism is the most common form of prejudice and discrimination experienced in the UK. And according to the World Health Organization, half of the world's population is ageist against older people. There exists a pervasive general narrative of aging associated with illness and burden, and an outdated stereotype of a demographic obsessed with saving and frugality, of mend and make do. No one is denying as you age things change. The very definition of aging is a process during which structural and functional changes accumulate in an organism as a result of the passage of time, resulting in decline until death. But this is a very physiological definition of aging. Other aspects of a person's life also change with age. And besides, only one quarter of older people have a condition severe enough that it seriously impacts carrying out acts of everyday living, meaning three quarters are totally able and we assume as interested in consuming and integrating with society as anyone else. So we need to not simply focus on improving the lives of people who may be living with some form of age related frailty, but to also understand the aspirations of older people to promote, to promote the assets of aging of which there are many. For example, older people commit less crime and have fewer car crashes. They have the highest average reported levels of happiness, satisfaction, and a sense of well-being. They provide more unpaid care and offer financial support to their families, volunteer more within their communities and donate more to charitable causes. They are more likely to act on the issues of climate change, including boycotting a product or company for socially conscious reasons. But we feel the most important asset of aging is the potential to become wiser. A full life of experience and inquisition and endless opportunity to reflect and distill that knowledge should result in wiser decisions which surely must have an impact on spending and consumption. And this is what we're really trying to get to the bottom of. What do older, wiser consumers want? Not what do they need? We already know this and have stores full of dust gathering, gray aluminum, agricultural aids and devices. But what do they really actually want? 
to help them live happier, healthier lives. And this is a great reason for gerontologists and businesses to come together and everyone would benefit from the results. Thank you. Thank you so much, Colin. Um, I, I really like your uh, three A's there, aspirations, assets, and acquisition of knowledge. So I've, I've, I've written that down. I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to steal that if that's okay. I'm, I'm, um, I'm stealing it from you. I never said that. Yeah, I've got me that part. <laughs> um, we've got, we don't have any questions. We do have a, a, a comment, which you might, you might like to comment back on. Uh, uh, it says, older adults also put off, are also put off by being sold to by people who sell in an inappropriate way or are not able to speak uh, to a person, et cetera. And that's from Dominique. I, th I think that's perfectly correct. Um, and I think that's part of being wiser is that you can spot these things. You know, there's something um, about being a consumer for 40 odd years or 50 odd years that makes you spot when you're being blatantly sold to and inappropriately sold to. Um, and I think that is one of the things with the, the wiser consumer that we have to learn about. Thank you. And we, we have a hand up. Um, Nigel. Um, yeah. Um, hi, Carl. Uh, thanks for that. Can you hear me okay? Can, yes. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes my Zooms. So I really enjoyed the talk. Um, I, I think, and I've got the grey hair to prove it, um, I, you know, older people, you know, want what everybody else wants. And, and I, I, um, I'm very worried about segmenting the market for older people. Um, I think it's really not helpful. We don't sell products for millennials or Generation X or middle-aged people. We just sell products. And, and I think if you want to look at you know, inclusive design products, you know, like the, the iPad happened to be and things like the Ford Focus, that they're just not sold as, as products for a particular segment. They're sold, they're great designs, you know, um, appropriately designed and they appeal right across the board uh, and, and so I just think we need really well designed great products that don't necessarily appeal to one age group or the other that just enable you to live your life to the full and enjoy it. I, I, I wouldn't disagree I use the segmentation argument purely as reflection on industry's obsession with youth rather than its, uh, rather than its uh, merits and benefits. Um, I do think that you do need to understand your customer regardless yes. of age. Um, and sometimes that means creating personas and that might be reflected as segmentation. But I think, yeah, understanding what people want, um, I think is, is hugely important. But I, but I would agree uh, if we create sort of these dumb segments and start shoving stuff at people, we'll just be back to where we started pretty quickly. Yeah. And of course, as a designer, you know, you know, the, you know, the, the inclusive design, you know, all about that, and, you know, making sure your product, you know, it, you know, you, is, is easy to use, can, you know, has a big enough font, hasn't got small buttons and, and all the rest of it. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank you, Nigel, for your question. Thank you, Colin. There are uh, questions and comments popping up in the chat, but we're going to uh, move to our second section. So uh, I just want to say thank you to all of our uh, uh, panel members so far for your reflections and for the questions. I'm going to hand over to George, who's going to introduce us to the next section. Good. So we're going to spend uh, half an hour breaking out. Uh, we've got um, five rooms and I think in a minute Rob will bring up a slide showing um, the five sections. Um, we've asked the speakers to spread out uh, around the room so um, uh, and then you'll be uh, invited to join a room uh, randomly. If, if everyone piles into room one because that's the easiest button you, you might find yourself reassigned. Um, but what we want, two things, one, one, one is not on the slide, which is um, just a chance for a smaller group of you to get to know each other. It's great to have seen the introductions um, coming through on, on the chat, but just um, take a little bit of time to get to know who's there and then uh, address the, the, the topic that, that's in there. Um, it's actually gonna be a very easy ask at the end. Do we want you to come back with um, just two things? One is, your top point for answering that question um, that you would recommend to, to the British Society of Gerontology. And the second is um, an example um, that you can um, offer to us of, of best or, or indeed worst practice uh, that we can pick up and, and learn from as we progress this group. So two, two action points that, that you'll see there, um, very simple. And um, in a moment, uh, Rob will... Um, set the, um, the, the breakouts up. But in the UK, that's like AARP that represents a very broad group of people, 
not frail or old or any of those um, medical diagnoses or stereotypes of, of aging, but, but understanding that. And then I think, um, well, actually I'll give two examples. Um, we, we had a fascinating example from Russia, which is still actually true in this country, writing people off at retirement age. Um, retirement ages, which are arbitrary um, now and, and don't actually reflect people's um, physical uh, abilities and, 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 and desires. Um, but the other good example that came out um, uh, was of someone's mother who took a PhD at 70 and is still um, a super ager, um, active and, and, and beyond that. So, you know, promoting the sort of stereotypes that were, turning some of those examples in, into, into role models on, on what aging can be like and helping businesses understand that there are people like that out there, I think is um, a, an interesting sort of example. So, so that, that was our group. And thank you, group. It was a great conversation. Thanks, George. Um, I, I was number two. So um, we were uh, focused on the, the short term, quick wins, what could we do now? And um, we, we, we had a, a, a great uh, discussion dominated by two themes really, which was around um, access and building relationships between the stakeholder groups. And the second one was on funding. Um, and our, our, our kind of priority action back to uh, the BSG was um, around opening up the directory of gerontologists to, to businesses so that it's not a members only access to, to really help um, organizations get in touch with gerontologists. And, but also then ensure that there are um, events, networking events or other opportunities where people can get to know each other so that you build those long-term relationships that are really necessary to, to you know, undertake a number of different types of work. Um, and um, in, instead of, uh, I know we're supposed to come back with one priority action, so I'm going to be naughty and um, use our, our worst case scenario uh, as, as a, uh, instead of a, another action point, and that was really about funding. And uh, there was quite a lot of discussion around the fact that funding is, um, in, we, we had a lot of experiences shared around funding. The funding landscape is quite inaccessible to non-academics and um, that you can have SMEs who are investing a lot of time in putting together bids um, and at the end of a quite significant period of time they don't get anything and they don't get any feedback that helps them to really um, develop and that was our, our worst case um, presentation which, which of course also indicates it's another priority really around um, helping people understand that landscape better. And um, one of the suggestions, and it was a suggestion that I've heard elsewhere, is that we need to look at plugging the gap for more agile funding between the small pots of money, there are large pots of money, but the middle ground is, is missing. So group three. That's me. And so um, we were tasked with answering how we might sustain this effort over the long term. Um, and by some coincidence, we ended up having an automotive theme to our discussions. Um, and so the challenge we had for BSG, the kind of action point, is to find gritty and specific issues that we can tackle that bring the business world and the world of gerontologists together. Um, and the example we had there was the automotive industry and autonomous vehicles. So a, an area that is developing. Um, and where there are particular questions that gerontologists can really support, where there's particular opportunities for the automotive industry to serve older people. So we could see whether that might be um, this group creating insight papers, working out what gerontologists have to say on this issue and using that to engage the industry or finding people in the industry who are keen to work on those issues and supporting them with links um, to gerontologists. Um, so that's kind of one suggestion of finding those gritty and specific issues and, and really nailing down on one at, one at a time and using that to get people, get stakeholders in the room and, and sustain the conversation that way. We talked about um, best or worst practices to highlight. And again, uh, example came from automotive industry. So um, you should have heard an example from um, uh, Japan where the government were concerned about dementia and did a deal 
with Nissan, in which Nissan agreed to employ people with dementia in the final cleaning and polishing of cars before they're rolled out of the factory. And in fact, only people with dementia were doing that job. And the links with gerontology were really important um, in creating that change and allowing that to happen. Um, and across both of those um, issues that we talked about, there's an issue of tackling age discrimination and knowing that whatever we do, we'll have to address this. And we talked about whether we could create tools that can help hold the mirror up to people so that they can see their ageism, so we can show that bias and how that might be limiting the opportunities that people are thinking about. Thank you, Tim. Group four. Uh, that was my group. Uh, we also had a really interesting discussion. Uh, we were tasked with addressing how in the medium term, older consumers can be re better represented on the agenda for business. Um, and so there were quite a few points, but it was definitely about aligning with, with industry. So, you know, aligning with um, organizations who have cloud, such as consumer associations and, and lobbying when um, we see things that are ageist or have um, representation um, image visual representation of kind of a, a frail older person. Um, we spoke about um, during COVID in particular the the frail old, older hand that was used again and again and again um, to represent kind of a, a body of so-called older people. Um, also, that there's um, that to address this is to use a wider range of of images. Um, another point was that. The, a more age diverse workforce. Um, you're not gonna get products and services that are designed for an older consumer if they're not being designed by an older innovator and designer. Um, so to have uh, you know, employers in corporations who have the lived experience, they know which uh, social media platforms or, or technology is being used because they're using it themselves. Um, so to have them also in the marketing room um, and then also to create a design inclusive standard um, would be an action point um, and partnership with industry so you know either having a portal or a website which would enable that engagement between gerontology and between the business sector um, then with regards to kind of best and worst practice best practice again goes back to inclusive design um, and Nigel was talking about the University of Cambridge, that they've really made um, great inroads with inclusive design, but that this message needs to be repeated. Um, it can't just be put out there once again and again, this message needs to go out there. Um, and then Lucy was uh, talking about a specific company that she had been dealing with, um, Serious Readers. And I think what really resonated with that was the good customer service. Um, and I think that again, that's universal. Um, and then the worst practice is assuming what older people need. Mm. Uh, and I think also worst practice, just going back to that stereotyping of aging images, um, the frail older hands, for example, um, but a really interesting conversation. So thank you, group four. Thank you. And Eric. Group yeah, five. well, uh... A lot of uh, what we had uh, seemed to have come out in some of the earlier groups. I mean, I think ageism was really the key theme that came out uh, in, in uh, our, our discussion in various guises. I mean, I think there, there, Catherine had a great suggestion around uh, a repository of data and, and uh, you know, keeping that up to date. Uh, our industry doesn't seem to be as good as others. Uh, at having uh, the latest and greatest information easily accessible. Um, I, you know, I think Center for Aging Better does a good job, but I also think, you know, when I go online to government review behind the population of uh, future of an aging population published by OLS. So I think that was one recommendation. So, um, you know, uh, Catherine talked about uh, universities. It says my internet's unstable. Can you still see me okay? I can, yeah. Uh, hopefully. So, thanks. So, um, uh, it, it, universities have a potential opportunity to lead the way walking the talk uh, in terms of public engagement. Uh, there, you know, what, what can universities do to be good role models around uh, attack, uh, uh, tackling the ageism issue? So, 
you know, good examples of uh, workforce and, and uh, role model. You know, we really need a role for what the healthy aging looks like. And, and universities and gerontologists in universities can um, help drive that with, within their specific environment. So I think um, there, there's a wide set of uh, things that we can be doing there. So, so I've mentioned a couple of, uh, you know, uh, th there wasn't any specific criticism, but there wasn't a good or a bad. I think there's always always things that you can do to improve with with these areas. So, you know, th there's a community of practice in place. I, I think, you know, um, there's always more that we can do to make that bigger and better. I think the Center for Aging better, we can do bigger and better, um, but it's better than it was when they started. So I, I think there's a lot of really good uh, initiatives to, to build on here. And so I think um, this the BSG SIG has a few specific actions to build on. Thank you, Eric. George, you, you are mute. Um, so we've heard from, from the, the groups in the breakout, uh, just a sort of final opportunity for um, people who've heard from, from breakout rooms that they weren't in, but maybe wanted to be, if, if there's anything you would like to add or comment. So if you, if you want to say something, put, put your hand up or, or drop something into the chat. But uh, I mean, overall, I, I, I sort of entered this with some trepidation this, this evening. Um, I think it's actually been um, a fabulous discussion. So thank you very much. We've got a huge amount to go away and sort of process and, and digest. But I think there are some really strong sort of common themes that, 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 that come out of today. I'm not going to name them because I think I think I promised to go away and digest them first. But um, um, really, really good conversation. So thank you um, from me for um, everyone who, who's joined from all around the world. So thank you. Thank you. Um, we uh, we have a challenge from Anthony in the question and challenge, what could be the cool new customer friendly title and strap line for gerontology that nations can understand and embrace? I'm not sure we've got, uh, we've got an answer immediately. George, you were gonna say. Uh, uh, I think that was really the, the theme that came out of, of the breakout group that I was um, in, which is language is gonna be really important in, in moving away from, uh, almost a title that, that, that encourages age discrimination to, mm -hmm. to one that's actually about, try, it, it, it's almost, it's almost um, as if we're sort of moving in, um, in, into the world of anthropology, which is understanding all ages and cultures rather, rather than just, um, just, just at one end of the spectrum. But um, I'll be challenged by others on, on that, I'm sure. But, uh, uh, yeah, terminology came up with us as well in our in our group, and 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 I, you know, the other facilitators also said the same thing. So terminology is is a big, uh, I think, an additional action that we um, need to add to the list. Um, just reflecting while um, that yeah, Anthony said, let's give it some time. What well, well, if in case there are other questions? Uh, for me, um, the the diversity of the perspectives that we've heard from has been incredibly useful, and a really broad ranging discussion. And um, I, I was thinking about when, when the facilitators were all talking uh, about what came back from the short, mid and long term is that um, it, we, we've, got, we've talked about the short term in terms of our quick wins, but those quick wins are about building relationships that, that exist that really develop over the long term. And what really struck me was uh, that the middle, mid term, the facilitators of what, how we need to get to where we want to get to, there was a big long list there around public engagement, role models, um, supportive and agile funding, aligning with industry, need to lobby, co-creation and design, older entrepreneurs, you know, just a, a, that area is, is really rich with, with um, um, actions. And, and finally, where do we want to go to? And um, the, the, again, this was actually raised in our short-term um, workshop as well, was, where, where, where do we want, what themes do we want to work on? Uh, the, one of the groups talks about gritty issues. Um, and, and, I, and I think, you know, a lot, a lot of the themes that have come through really are about challenging those stereotypes. And if we challenge those stereotypes and, um, 
and, and, and really do that very constructively, then we really are going to move forward with this. But it's, it's definitely some, a big, big, big challenge and issue for us. It's interesting, um, just to pick up on that, um, and Dominic, I'll let you come in um, in, in a minute, but, but um, Sharon and our group really talked about how actually demographic change is one of the things that will probably drive a change in language as well, but uh, so we need to pick up. So, Dominic. You... Sorry, I couldn't find the mute button. Um, just, just one thing, I think quite a lot of forums internationally these days, and, and a lot of the talk is about healthy aging and active aging and all the positive stuff we need to do, which I think is fantastic. I just, because I used to be an NHS chaplain as well, and I've dealt with the weakness a lot. I think that I do sometimes have a slight worry that the stereotyping could go the other way at the moment, because lots of us do fear aging. There are things about aging or weakness that we do fear that it's necessary to also still remember that there are always going to be some people who are frail and vulnerable, whatever their age, and that in pushing all the positive stuff, we also just remember that there's, you know, those of us who are going to be like that or are like that will need care. And that 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 also doesn't need to be sidelined. As a society, we're quite bad at being vulnerable and weak and supporting the weaker members. So I, I always do have that concern that we're going to go too far the other way and people will be passed over when they do have needs as well. So. We, we need a more accurate understanding or a more accurate perspective. Yeah, absolutely. We've got three hands up and they're all lined up. So David, you were first. Yeah, I just wanted to say quickly, uh, Debbie, in your group on the issue of funding and, and raising money, uh, it, it's so spot on. Um, uh, elderly care funding is, uh, especially in the tech space, is much different how it is than, than in the rest of the tech sector. Um, the barrier is so much higher. Uh, you have to wait more. You have to wait longer. You have to have a. You have to have collaborations. And I don't know if I don't want to offend any academia here, but sometimes it's like herding cats when it comes to 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 getting a, a collaboration for a uh, for a grant. And the grant itself takes. You know, the smart grant itself is like almost thirty pages. You can't have the time to run a business and continue writing all of these grants over and over yeah. that you don't even know are going to be successful. So in the end, um, in the tech space, you can give you give something a try for a year, see how it goes. But in, in elderly care and technology, you it's sort of like a two year, three year commitment without necessarily making money until you get that first grant to then get your investor um, on, on board. So it is much tougher in the space in terms of technology. I think that is one of the biggest barriers is, yeah. is how we can get uh, um, how we can get funding. And lastly, on the space, just for, for clarity, so people know, in the tech sector, most of the funding is actually going to like care home tech and is not really going to, to keeping people in their homes. Um, the vast majority, even though we know in the future, we're gonna have to keep people in their homes. That's where, that's where the money is being put. And even when you look at the money, it's, it's really large companies that set up like startups, but they're not really startups because, you know, the, 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 the parent company is a large conglomerate. So it's, there's not really a lot of funding, um, VC funding that goes into the space and the trajectory is much longer. So that's, that's my yeah. point on that. Thank you, David, thank you. And certainly reflects the discussion that we had in the group as well, absolutely. Um, Ian, I think you were next. Thanks, Debbie. Um, I'm Ian Philp, I'm the privilege of chairing the special interest group. And, um, I um, want to say two things. The first thing I wanted to say was to thank George and Debbie and everybody because this has been absolutely fantastic and it will take a lot of reflection to draw out all the insights that have been generated, but it's been really powerful and thank you for your leadership. Um, and I, the specific point I wanted to make with to, to follow on from Dominic's point, which I agree with, is that we, the advantage I think of having a community of uh, social scientists working in this space is that we won't just follow um, a, a superficial campaigning uh, model to try and address the challenges of aging and the challenges which older people face. We'll try and bring enlightenment and understanding to both the opportunities that come with aging and the opportunity to reframe aging, but also the nature of suffering in old age, 
which currently is inevitable for many older people. And um, so I think I think we will try and take a balanced approach to that. And the, the, the biggest challenge we face as a special interest group as a small body is to harness the expertise we've got in our various interlands and make a difference. And I think we'll coming out of the session today, we'll find things where as a special interest group, we collectively, that's everybody here on the call and wants to continue the journey with us, will collectively make some uh, make a bit of a difference. Um, so thank you. Thank you. And Eric. Great. Uh, yeah, sorry. Thanks. I just wanted to build quickly uh, also on what Dominique had said, because I think it's quite important. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I actually saw it slightly differently than Dominique did. I, I didn't see this as like everything is rosy. Uh, I, what I think is what I heard, uh, particularly from Column's discussion, was a segmentation based on needs. Uh, and needs doesn't always reflect a particular. Um, age I, I you know i've been to care homes who are people are younger than me i'm 56 and there are people younger than me in some of these uh, care homes and i was quite thankful not to be there but you know if if you look, bundled everyone over 50 uh, i would certainly not want to be uh, buying some of the products and services so i think it's really around needs. Uh, I, I know Netflix in particular does psychographic profiling. They don't use age at all in any of their segmentation. And I think it's around needs based uh, rather than uh, a, a, a specific uh, age demographic. So, so I, I, don't, um, I don't disagree at all with what you're saying there. You know, there, there are different, there's a different challenge when we're talking about um, gerontology and engaging with business because uh, the smaller the market, the harder it falls for business to invest at scale. And, and so I think there's a different business model. It might be a charity model or a, s a social enterprise model. Um, but all of the needs are, are important. So I think bridging the gap between the different uh, needs and, and business is quite important to understand um, yeah, the, the business model around all of that. It's my favorite topic. At the end of the session, I will now, but uh, I'll certainly, I, I, that should probably be a topic for the future, Ian. Thanks, Eric. Thanks. And uh, I, I just want to draw attention to one comment from Grace, uh, who says, we're all aging in one way or another and in different ways. How do you feel? And I think that that's a very good comment to to end on George is there anything else that you would like to say I, I think um I think uh, everything's been said so so thank you yeah. well thank you so much everybody I think we're going to hand over to Rob you're on mute Rob Great. Uh, Debbie, George, uh, I really just want to say echo, is, echo Ian's comments and just to say thank you so much. This has been an absolutely scintillating experience. It, it's been so full of insight. And I think I've been one of the few people to have the pleasure of walking through the different breakout groups and in each of the rooms that there were outstanding conversations taking place. And so thank you so much for, for all the effort and energy you've put into organising today and also to thank a few other folk uh, who've been involved in this as well. So the people who have moderated our breakout groups, uh, of course, our wonderful panelists uh, who spoke today and have led us so expertly through this conversation, but also to thank uh, our organizers, uh, Jane Guest uh, and Charlotte Duggan at UKRI and our own Namrita Sharma at uh, Age Care Technologies who have just put in a really valiant effort to deliver uh, an outstanding program of insight gathering. So, so thank you very much. Uh, what I'd like to do now, just in closing, uh, is just to share uh, with the group that uh, we will be coming together again, uh, date to be confirmed. Uh, we were hoping late March, but at this point is probably early April. Um, we'll be meeting to organize this event from next week. Um, and the topic will be how can we enable gerontology and business to support the decade of healthy aging? This is our third uh, vital question uh, of investigation. 
uh, and our leaders for that session are David Sinclair, Professor Mario Barbagallo, uh, Natalie Elmit from Home Instead UK, and Susan Well Schwartz uh, from the Global Coalition on Aging. Uh, as you would have gathered, we are very keen for people who have participated today to sign up to membership. Please uh, do visit uh, abs sig at britishgerontology.org where you can sign up to uh, to join this group you'll also find a host of resources that are being developed and it's a movable feast but we're, we're getting there um and equally we'll be able to show you links to the recordings of these videos i think one of the things we just want to say is that there's a huge amount of synthesis to do here um and so please rest assured that we will work as a group uh, to gather that synthesis we will, uh, at the outset of this meeting, be conducting a small internal report, which ultimately will be combined uh, through the three questions that we've been asking and make its way into uh, the BSG Annual Congress, hopefully uh, for a satellite symposium there, assuming we are approved. So with that in mind, I would just like to thank everybody for attending today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in a few weeks time. And please look out uh, for the outputs from this meeting. Thank you very much for your time and have a great evening. Thank you.